hello how do i sound perfect thank you guys for coming out to our last event of the year it's been a long year i hope you guys loved all the events we held and if it wasn't for you guys we wouldn't be here making all these wonderful events so thank you guys for coming out this last review session i hope it's a banger i hope you guys do well on your final uh that's pretty much everything. So if you guys want to be a part of LCS for next year, we're going to be opening hiring in April. So just keep an eye out on our socials and then we'll, uh, we'll let you know. Yeah, so thank you guys again for coming. My name is Yana and I'm an event coordinator. So basically the event's probably going to run until nine. We're going to have a short break around eight for a little snack break and like just to go to the bathroom. I mean, you can go to the bathroom whenever you want, but just a little break and then around 8 30 I think we'll do a Q&A so that'll be when the slides finish and then we'll go into Q&A thank you all for coming and I'm going to pass it to Steven yo okay how's it going guys I'll be your host for tonight my name's Steven I'm a second year student I'm doing a double degree in BBA and CS and I took CP 164 only a couple semesters ago so I know exactly what boat you guys are in right now so hopefully I'm gonna use my expertise to help you guys out with this final exam a little bit. We'll go over, let's look at, before we start actually, if you guys wanna sign in really quick to get this on your Laurier experience record, go ahead, just sign the QR code or um, Jesus the link. Yeah, so everybody on Twitch, just scan the QR code. You'll get this on your Laurier experience record. I'll keep it up for just a couple minutes. So everybody has a chance to do it. Okay, hopefully that was enough time for everyone. We'll uh, we'll put it back up at the end of the session just in case someone missed it. Um, all right, so for today's agenda, we're just gonna be going over couple new subjects that you guys learned since our last review session. So we're gonna be going over hashing and hash, hash sets, how they're used, what they are, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna be going over sorting and different types of sor sorting algorithms, um, their efficiencies, what they're used for. Um, and then we're just gonna go over a bit of a term review, focusing mostly on the things that in previous have been on the final exam. And I'll just give you guys a few study tips just at the very end before we jump into any questions that you guys have. So yeah, it's just gonna be a pretty chill. I don't know, if you guys have any questions just while we're going through, just raise your hands. Anybody in the Twitch chat, you guys can drop that as well. So um, just a few links and resources. We show this before every review session. Um, yeah, you can use those freely. Um, okay, so we're gonna be starting off with hashing and hash sets. So we're gonna go over what they are, some common use cases and some examples, a live example using Replit. I'll probably draw something on the board as well. All right, so what is hashing? So a hash function is a function that when given a key value, returns an integer value. So this key value can be of any type. Any object can have a hash value. So let's say we're taking a food object, for instance. We can take its name and um, turn that into uh, an integer value using what is called like an ORD function in Python. So that returns just its, um, its integer value pretty much. And so we're gonna look over some hashing functions afterwards, but that's essentially in essence what a hash function is. So these can be used to organize and sort items in a way that retrieval and insertion is much more efficient. So if you look at just a list of items, for example, insertion is very easy because you can just, either you insert it into a index and that's a, an O of one operation because you already know where the index is. You just have to go to that place in the list and put the value. You can append it, which is just putting it at the end, also an O of one operator. Or you can put it at the start, which is also an O of one operator. But the tricky part comes when you're trying to retrieve something from a list that isn't sorted. So for that, you have to look through the entire list, which is, as we know, an O of n time complexity. So when that happens, Algorithms with lists that aren't sorted get extremely inefficient with big sets of data. So with a hash set, both the retrieval and the insertion will be O of one uh, time complexity and we'll see why in just a second. So hashing functions can be simple or extremely complicated based on the use case of the function. 
So if we just have a simple set of data, we can have a hash function, for example, that's just like taking um, a string and converting it, like each letter, to a 1 through 26 value. So that's a very simple ha like example of a hashing function. So let's say A, for example, will have a value of 1, B will have a value of 2, and we can just change each number to, um, uh, each, um, each character to a number, sorry. So that's a very simple example of a hashing function. This can be very useful for us. And an extremely complicated example would be cryptography, for instance, where the hashing function is pretty much the key to um, unlocking whatever data you have. And without it, it's like almost impossible to crack. So, so a hash set is an advanced data type that has its values organized based on a hash value. This makes it much more efficient to retrieve and insert into the arrays of values. So to insert, we have to run the hash function on the value given, and the integer that is returned will be the index in which we put the item. So let's say we have a hash function. Uh, never mind, I don't got to use the board now, but let's say we have a hash function that, like I was explaining before, just having a string that gets converted to numbers. Let's say we have a character string of C. So C will be A is one, B is two, and C is gonna be three. So the hash function is just gonna turn the C into a three, and that's gonna be our key or our index value. So if we had a hash set where this is our hash function, we take that C value and insert it at the third position. And removing is the same way. If we wanna remove the C value, we run it through the hash function again, and we get the same three back. So we know that we have to go to the third index of the hash set and just remove the three out of there. So that's why in a hash set, it's much more easy and much more efficient to retrieve and insert data. So, like I was saying before, the common use cases of hash sets are cryptography. So without the hashing function, no party has an efficient way of cracking a message or any form of data. So let's say you have a huge, huge string that you want to decode, but you have no idea how to decode it. If you were to send a party the hashing function that you used to code it in the first place, they can just run the thing back into it and get the message that you wanted them to get. But somebody who doesn't have access to the hash function really has no way of doing this efficiently. They're just gonna have to run a brute force algorithm to find what was, what was in that data. So like we said before, it has O of one time complexity for the insert and the remove and search functions. So, um, Let's look at some code examples really quick. So first of all, let's start with the hashing functions so that we understand better how hash sets are built. So this is a hashing function that you guys were given in your lab, I believe. So here um, we have the value of zero. So this is just the hash value. We're just initializing it. So we're going through each character in the string and adding its ORD value, which is like just a unicode of the character, so it's, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just like an integer value of any character, so like, it's not just limited to the alphabet, so that's all you guys really have to know. And so this is an irreversible hash, so if you were to give it um, a key value, it wouldn't be able to return the value itself. So let's say you had a string of like ABC, it would be converted to a value of let's say 12, but you can't give another function that 12 and expect to return the ABC because we're having, we have a cumulative value right here. So to make, to demonstrate this a little bit better, we have two functions that are hash functions, but they're reversible. So here we have a cipher that turns a string, same thing as this, it uses the ORD value. So it turns the string into its Unicode, but it adds it back into a string. So we have each individual character in the string gets turned into a, a number. So we have this right here, the LCS wishes you best on your final exams. We can just cipher this. So we'll run that really quick and it gets ciphered to this. So 76, 67, 83, 32 and whatnot, right? So um, now this decipher, we're doing the same exact thing, but we're, um, we're just doing it the other way around. So this int function, is the opposite of the ORD function. So when we have an irreversible hash, we just have to do the same exact thing we did in the hash function itself, but just reverse it. So it's pretty much just a plus and minus operator if you think about it. The hash is the plus operator and the dehash is the minus operator. 
this isn't really gonna be that useful to you guys, but it really comes in handy when you're trying to understand hash sets and how hashing functions work. So if we look here, this decrypting, um, this deciphering a, a function has an unscrambled string that's initialized at nothing right now and a string list which takes the string of these numbers, the 76 up to 115, and splits them at each number. So we just have a, a list of numbers now. So for each i in string list, so for each number, the unscrambled equals we're turning it back into a character and from the integer, we're, like, we're turning it into an integer first because these will be, um, since it's a string, we're splitting it up into a list of strings. And then this char is the opposite of the ord. So the ordinary is turning a character into a number and the char, the chr function right here, is turning a, um, a number back into its character using the same Unicode um, conversion. So it's pretty much just doing the exact opposite. So like division and multiplication, addition and subtra subtraction, and whatnot. And it's just turning it back. So each letter corresponds, each number corresponds to each letter. So that, in essence, is what we're doing. Okay, so now let's look at just the implementation of a hash set itself. So we don't have any of the init functions, uh, like any of the constructors, because you guys already know how to do that. It's given to you guys in your notes. So we have the find slot. So this is pretty much um, the hashing function itself. Sorry, things keep popping up. So here we're just finding which slot let me draw this out for you guys. Sorry to the people watching on Twitch, you won't be able to see this, but I'm gonna draw out just a simple diagram of a, a hash set. So let's initialize, sorry, sorry. Let's initialize a hash set with five slots and a load capacity of 20. So this is like very basic. This is most likely what you guys see in your labs and whatnot. So let's say slots here, we'll give it a value of five. People in the back tell me if this is too small, I'll make it bigger. So. Slot here, slot here, slot here, slot here. Shit. <laughs> and slot here. Okay, so there's five slots. These are all arrays. So let's say these can hold up to 20 values each because that's the load. Let's, let's write that, sorry. Load factor. Okay, so. Each of these can hold 20 values each, and this entire thing is, I don't know why I put this here. Let's change this to four. Okay, so this combined is the hash set. So um, the find slot is just giving, we're getting a value and we're hashing it and finding which slot it belongs in. So let's say uh, we're given a value of a, for instance, and the hash function returns to us three. So we know that we're gonna go in slot one, slot two, slot three, and the C, what did I say A? The A character is gonna fit into here. So that's what find slot is doing. The rehash is a bit of an odd function, but rehash um, just doubles the amount of slots that you have when you've exceeded the load factor. So when there's too many things, in the hash table, you obviously want to expand it so that you can add more things. You don't want a hash table with not enough slots for values because it, it wouldn't really be useful. So here, we're pretty much just taking this table and creating a new table with, um, with twice as many slots as you guys can see there. So self slots equals self slots times two plus one. So in this case, it would be nine slots instead of the original four. And we're just like pretty much moving all the values from the original table into the new table and finding their slots with the hash value. So the rehash is pretty simple function, but it's gonna come um, into play when we have the insert, especially because of this right here. So when the load factor, when we reach our load factor, so when each of the, um, when each of the, uh, the slots is full, we're gonna have to rehash so that we can add more values into the hash set itself. So let's go over this insert and I will give a drawing explanation so that it's a little bit easier to digest. Oh, yeah. So um, just for clarification, how many self would go into a slot in this 
So it would be the load factor. So this is. Yeah, so when each, like if you see there, load factor times self slots. So when each of the slots is full, you have to rehash and just like double the amount plus one. Just because, yeah. So in this case, if you have 80 items. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, more than 80 items, but yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, okay. Um, so here, so the insert starts with finding which slot we want to insert in, which is very simple because we already determined this find slot function just using very simple uh, hash function that we have. So this isn't defined to anything because it can be anything. So hash sets are like, the way that they're organized is really dependent on the hash function. So you guys can make that to whatever you want. And on your exam, if you guys deal with hash sets, you'll obviously be given the hash function. So it's nothing to worry about. So we find the slot, first of all. So let's say our, um, our slot is three, like we said before. So if value in slot, if we already have an A here, we just return false. So the insert function is returning a Boolean of either false or true when it's inserted. So else we don't like, um, it's not in this. And so we can literally just insert it like a list and then we just check the load factor. And that's like, in essence, all there is to know about insertion and hash sets. You just run the value through the hash function. If it's in the slot, you don't insert it. If it isn't in the slot, you insert it um, add one to the count and then check if the load factor has been passed. And if so, you rehash. So you just add more slots and move all the values into it. So the remove is pretty much the same exact thing. And the remove is honestly very simple because you can just use the find slot again and you're just checking if it's here and the, uh, the remove, which is a, a list function, will just remove nothing if, um, if it's not there. So we're pretty much just finding the slot again. So let's say we're searching for A just because it's the only thing in our list. The uh, find slot gives us three again. The value will give us A. And then the self count will be decremented by one. So that's pretty much how hash sets work. Yeah, Lucas. Yeah, sure. Uh, it's right here. If value in slot. So it's, it's just because each slot is already a list. So you can treat it exactly how you would treat a list. Yeah, because this is like, you, you can just think of a hash set as just an ADT of a 2D list in essence. But it's just one row. One row of slots that you can, like, that you can expand if it's exceeded the load factor. So... Let's move on to sorting and sorting algorithms. So, so when do we use sorting and some common use cases and we'll go over um, some very common sorting algorithms that you guys, I'm pretty sure of all, like you've come across all of them in your labs and assignments and we'll show when these are useful and which kinds of data sets they're useful on. So what is sorting? Like all of you guys know what sorting is. It's taking multiple values that are ordered in an arbitrary manner and changing their positions so that they're sorted in a more readable way. There are a wide variety of sorting algorithms that all have different use cases. Some are extremely efficient for small sets of data, but inefficient for medium or large sets of data and vice versa. And we'll look at those in just a second. So many sorting algorithms are the opposite, like I said, where they can only handle large sets of data efficiently. So let's start off with the insertion sort. So the insertion sort has a time complexity of O n squared, and it's very efficient, very inefficient for large sets because of its time complexity, but handles small sets of data better than most other sorting algorithms. The selection sort is the same as insertion sort. It's very inefficient on large sets of data because of its O n squared time complexity. However, it's less efficient than insertion sort when it comes to smaller sets of data. Just because insertion sort um, came after selection sort and it's like an improvement on it. So, 
uh, shell sort has a time complexity of O n times log n, and shell sort is an optimization of insertion sort. So this means it's fairly efficient with small sets of data, but one of the most efficient sorting algorithms for large data sets. Uh, so this is quick sort. Uh, it has the same as same time complexity as before. It's n times log n, and it works efficiently with any sized data set. So before we move on, I'd like to show you guys just a little like snippet of a video. Sorry, should have brought this up beforehand, but I think it's really extremely helpful with just visualizing like how efficient these sorting algorithms or inefficient they are with small sets of data compared to large ones. Um, not type beat, come on. Uh, okay. We're not going to watch the entire thing, but I'll just... Sorry, you guys can't really hear, but... So, all you guys pretty much have to know about this video is... Um, one second. So each of these um, dots is a different sorting algorithm. And this first race is testing on a relatively small set of data. So, okay. So if you see some of them are, well, most of them are very quick with sorting it just because small sets of data don't really take that much computing power. But if you see one lags behind, and that's because this one is most likely optimized for extremely large sets of data. So it doesn't really know how to handle small sets of data. So let's move over to the medium. These ones kind of take a long time, but they are all the same sorting algorithms. So if we watch it again, And just another quick note, um, each like bend on this track is just another set of data that's increasing by a small amount. But like this is, these are all considered medium sets of data. So if you see like the purple one starts to lag behind because it was more efficient in the smaller sets of data. And if you saw this, um, this beige color was the one that lagged extremely far behind in the one before. So in the medium set, and we'll look at all of the, uh, well, large, it doesn't really matter. It's gonna, so if you saw, the pink one or the beige one from the start was one that had a linear time complexity. So this one is very optimized at working with large sets of data just because when the data gets huge, like let's say N is over a million, it's gonna be, much more efficient to run it with something like O of N rather than O of N squared, which if you see these were, were all ones that were fairly efficient with small sets of data, but extremely inefficient with the medium and large sets of data. And the ones in the middle are kind of in between in the sense that they're N log of N, which is fairly efficient with small sets of data and pretty efficient in large sets of data. So I hope that kind of illustrated my point a bit more in that Sorting algorithms, though they may all do the same thing at the end of the day, you have to select them um, for cases that fit uh, your use case. Yes. I could go over it in the Q and A session. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. The, I was just saying we're gonna we can look at Big O afterwards. It's not in the slideshow, but I can definitely go over it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we're just gonna look over uh, the term review so far. Um, not really looking at the stuff from the first half of the semester, more of the second half, just because um, the final exam is more based on like linked data structures, linked recursion, binary search trees, as here. And we're just gonna be going over afterwards. I'll be showing you guys explaining to you guys some of the problems that you might encounter or that I know that I encountered in the final exam. Okay, so let's just start off with what are linked data structures? They're common use cases, some examples. Um, 
So linked data structures are built with multiple nodes where each node is connected using pointers to the next node in the structure. So instead of an array, which is just a big list of data where they really have no connection except that they're part of the same array, these linked data structures are made up of nodes that have a value attribute and a next attribute. And we know that it's not just limited to those two attributes because we've worked with binary search trees where they have a value attribute and a left and right attribute, but that's for later on. So for example, the node in a linked list has a value attribute that holds the value itself and the next attribute that holds a pointer to the next node in the linked list. I think one thing that a lot of CP164 students have trouble with is that the next value is literally pointing to the node itself. It's not pointing to its value, but it's pointing to the node. So whenever you use a next function, you are going to the next position in the list. You're not going to the next value, you're going to the next position. So it's just a really like, okay, so we'll look at linked lists. So these are just lists, but implemented with nodes instead of arrays, fairly simple. Each value has data and next, and yep, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So if you see, so uh, for the Twitch chat, sorry, the uh, the question that was asked was, can you just elaborate more on how the next actually points to the next node, not just the next uh, like piece of data? So if you look at this next right here, it's not just pointing to the B of the next node; it's pointing to the entire node. So if you were to say, let's say we have a current variable, it's set to the head of the linked list in this case. If you say current equals current dot next, you are literally saying that current is now equal to B instead of A. So it's not just the B value, it's the B node itself. So that's pretty much what I was saying. And so this comes very handy, not just in Python, but there's like, you guys will learn like next year and the years to come. There are other languages, of course, like Java and C, for instance, that use, that don't have type inference. So like you can't just say a variable equals this. You have to say type, then the variable name equals this. So let's say we have a number. We have to say int num equals six. We can't just say num equals six. So this is gonna come in handy because we can't say, for instance, let's say our values are numbers. We can't say um, int equals head dot next because it doesn't make sense, right? Because head dot next is going to be pointing to a node object type, not an int as the values were to say. So it's just gonna come in handy later on and the fundamental understanding of that is extremely important. So the next is pointing to a node and it's not pointing to a value. So linked queue is the exact same but you guys know how queues work. It's just a linked implementation. So we have the front here, the rear here, um, the value, the next is pointing to the next node. Binary search trees are incredibly important. So this is the parent node. It's like the head of the other ones. And each node has a left and right attribute. And we'll go over binary search trees more in a minute, but these are one of the most efficient uh, abstract data types to use. And just a more uh, in real life example is like a blockchain, for instance. So each, and this is actually a hash set and a linked data structure. So we see here that the data is linked by the hash of the data before it. So this one isn't really the same in the sense that it's not, the next value isn't linking to a node, but rather it's linking to the hash of another node. So we see here that this is block n minus one and the block n has, it's like, let's say it's next attribute as the hash of block n minus one. And so that's how like blocks on the blockchain are connected. It's through hash values. And this is so, and these are like, let's say they're all transactions with like crypto or whatnot. So the hash is like pretty much how I was saying before in cryptography, where we don't want anybody to access the data of these transactions. So we need both a private key and a public key, and that's pretty much our hash function. So 
the data here can only be accessed with the hash here or the hash of the one before. So that's why the link structure is very important because we want to have the data of both the one before and the one after. So this is a very, very quick example. It's just a train station example. So let's say this train, each of these blocks are stations that the train can stop at and the train can only go in one direction. So we start in Toronto and it's next is the Kingston node. So we can travel to Kingston and the next is Ottawa and whatnot. We just keep going. This is a very simple example. I'm sure I don't have to keep it up for too long. Um, so now let's move on to linked recursion because this is an extremely important topic when discussing binary search trees and when discover, uh, discussing linked data structures in general because of just how simple it makes working with them and you can do some more things with recursion that you can't just do with iteration and we'll look at some examples of that. So what is linked recursion? As the name suggests, linked recursion is just recursion using linked data structures. So although recursive functions themselves usually seem more complex than their iterative counterparts, with linked, structure, with linked, linked structures, it is quite the opposite. So some common use cases for linked recursion are obviously linked lists and linked queues, like we were saying before, and binary search trees are one of the most, um, where linked recursion becomes the most useful. So let's look at an example of linked recursion and why you should be using linked recursion while working with linked uh, data structures. So here we just have um, the initialization of a simple linked list. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with this. Um, so we're just initializing the value, uh, the next value. So this is for the node and we're initializing the list by setting its front to none, setting the rear to none and setting the count to zero because we still don't have any items in it. Uh, is empty is just if self front is none, it'll return true. If it's not, it'll return false. And the length will just return self count. Um, so uh, we have a print list function. So this just takes everything in the list and prints it. So we have it both recursively here and iteratively here. So if we run this, this looks like it's a pretty simple function. So the base case is if front is none. So if we've reached the end of the list, then just return, do nothing. But if we aren't at the end of the list, we want to just print the value and call the function on the rest of the list. So the next, which is, as we explained before, the next node. And the iterative one is the same exact thing. So while front is not none, print the, uh, the value at the front and front equals front dot next, which is the next node. So we can do this perfectly fine. As we can see here, um, the values that we have in the list are one, two, three, four, five. So now we're running the iterative print and it works just fine. And the recursive print works just the same. But the problem comes when you're trying to go backwards, for instance, in a linked structure. How are you gonna do that with iteration? You can't start at the rear and go back because you have no previous value, for instance. If you were working with a doubly linked list, sure, you could just you start from the rear and just go previous, 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 and whatnot with iteration. But since we are using a singly linked list, which only has a next attribute, um, we can't really reverse print iteratively. But if you look here, how we do it with recursion is a little clever. So if front is none, the same base case as before, just return nothing. But now we're calling the reverse print recursive function before we call the print function. So what this is doing, I'll draw it out for you guys just because it's a little bit hard to understand why this would print the list in reverse order, sorry. All right, so, yeah. All right, so when we're calling the function first and not printing anything, um, <clears throat> we're gonna get to the very end of the list before we have even printed a value. 
So let's say, our, I'll, I'll draw it as an array based list just because it's a lot easier to visualize. Let's say we have an array of one, two, three. And we have the function reverse print. So here we're calling the function on this. And we know that the front is not none because we obviously have a one there. So we can go to the else statement. And so now we call reverse print before we call the print itself. So now we call the function on this. And so front is still not none. So we just go again and we call it again. This is still before we print anything. So we have three now and that's it. And so now we do the same thing. Front isn't none because we have the three of course. And we call the reverse print one more time. So now it's actually on an empty list. And so the if front is none, um, that condition is satisfied. So we return. So when we return, so the functions get called downwards and they get e executed upwards. So now we go back up and for each value, now we can print the front value. So now the print is called on the front of this. So we print three. The print is called on the front of this. So we print two. And the print is called on the front of this, so we print one. And if you guys see here, it's exactly how we expect it to run. So this is just a different example just because I use one, two, three, four, five. But this example demonstrates why recursion is a lot more useful than iteration while when working with linked structures, just because it gives you a lot more utility. And getting familiar with recursion is really going to help you guys use linked data structures much more efficiently in the future and on your final exam. So, let's go back. All right. So, let's talk about binary search trees, what they are, some common use cases, and we'll go over some examples. All right. So what is a binary search tree? A binary search tree is the first non-linearly linked data structure that you guys looked at. So this means that it'll have a value attribute along with more than one next attribute. So in this case, it's gonna have a left and right child node. So binary search trees have a unique attribute similar to the priority queue where each value to the left must be smaller than the node itself and each value to the right must be larger. And this attribute gives it the advantage to non-sorted lists because you can search through it in log n time. Let me explain to you why. So if we look at this list right here, this is these are both the same list, but one is sorted and one isn't. So let's say we're searching for which number in the list do you guys want to search for? 10? Ten. Ten? Oh, there's two tens. Okay, yeah, let's search for 10. So in this one, uh, 10 is the first one. So like we can, no, it's all good. It's all good. So let's, 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 let's search for 17. Um, so here, to search for 17, we just have to go through each item in the list and hope we find 17. So we go 10, 5. We just check if they're equal to 17, which they aren't until we hit this point here. But... With a, with a sorted list, we can do a binary search. So we can start in the middle and look at these two um, values and check if they're larger or smaller than 17. And based on that, we can go either left or right. So we look at 10 and we know that 17 is obviously larger than 10. So we go to the right of that. And it's the same exact thing with a binary search tree. So here in this image, they're searching for 16. So we know that 16 is larger than 15, so we go to the right. Everything on the right of the parent is going to be bigger. So then we get to the 20 node here, and 16 is still is smaller than 20, so we go to its left, and 18 is bigger than 16, so we go to its left again, and we find the key of 16. And let me explain why this is O log of n time. So we know that a while loop, we know that a for loop, let's say for i in list, this is just an arbitrary list with size n. 
For I and list, this will go through every single value of the list regardless. So it's always going to have a complexity of O of N because there's N values in the list. A while loop, uh, let's say while I is less than length of list. Um, this is going to have also O and wait one second. Let's just say the only thing that this does is I plus equals one. So this is also going to have O of N time complexity, right? Because we're going through every value of the list regardless of what happens because of this condition. But if we were to have a while loop, let's say while I is smaller than 10 or something and I starts at one, if we say I uh, times equals two, this will now, actually, it's not a good, sorry. Let's make another example. So let's say while I is let's say length of list again. So while I is smaller than length of list, but we're gonna have to um, div like cut down the list by half every time. So let's just say we find a way to index the list so that it's half as big. So let's say that this list gets cut in half every time every time i gets iterated by 1. So because this is getting cut in half, it's now going to be o of log n time. Because each time we go through the uh, the i variable once, we're cutting the list in half, so that shrinks the time complexity because we know that we don't have to go through the entire list. It's the same exact reason why these two search functions for the sorted list and for the binary search tree are both O log N of time. Because if you look here, sorry, if you look here, after we search the 15, we can completely disregard the left half of the tree. So the data that we're working with gets cut in half. So now we can just focus on this right subtree here. Same thing happens when we know that 20 is larger than 16. We can completely cut off the right side because those values are all going to be larger than 20. Same thing when we get to 18, and then 16 is obviously where we're going to stop. But if there were more values past 16 and we were looking for a different value, it would keep going. But that's why sorting, I mean, inserting and retrieving from a binary tree is more efficient because we can literally cut the data set in half every single time we pass an item. So let's look at a binary search tree and its implementation. All right. So obviously the node starts off the same way as any linked node, but it has two of these next attributes. It has a left and a right attribute. So um, update height, essentially, this is just to update. These are updating height of the node. So it's just going to get the, the max of the left height and the right height plus one. It's pretty self-explanatory. You're just trying to find how big, like how far does the node stretch down? It's not the count of the node, it's the height. So as you can see here, like the height is already initialized to one because it's, when you start off with one node, it's going to be at level one. If you um, give it a right child, now its height is going to be two. But if you give that same node a left child, its height is still going to be two, just because you aren't going down in the, uh, in the tree. So the BST um, is initialized with a root and a count of its own. And so the insertion function, uh, just let me check. Okay. All right, so the insertion function is calling an auxiliary function, and I'll draw this out as well just so we can see exactly what's going on. So if node, if the node that we're given is none, we know that the list, I mean, the, the binary search tree is empty, so we can just have node equal to the new node, which we're creating right here. We increment the count by one, and again, like the hash set, we have an inserted variable that is set to either false or true, whether or not uh, we insert a, um, 
piece of data or not. So, like we were explaining before, if we know that the value is larger or, or smaller than the value that we're currently at, we can go, we can completely cut off the right subtree. So we can just go left and we're just saying node left equals this, um, the, the same auxiliary function that we, were, we had before. So we're pretty much just disregarding the right subtree completely and just inserting in the left subtree now. So we have the same case, but the opposite. So when the value that we have is greater than the node value, um, then we go to the right and else. So this means that the node value and the value that we want to insert are the exact same, which we can't have. So a binary search tree also can't have duplicate values just because it really wouldn't make sense. Some can have duplicate values, but I'm pretty sure the ones that you're going to be working with won't have duplicate values just because um, it's either greater on the right or less than on the left. Some binary search trees come with the fact that it's greater than or equal to on the right. So just keep that in mind. But like the ones that you're going to be working with are just, yeah. So what happens if you have duplicate values? It, it just won't, like we see here, it doesn't, it doesn't insert. So inserted equals false and this else statement does nothing. So then if inserted, so if we've inserted, we just update the height of the node. So let's draw this out. So, oh, who was it? Yeah. Yes, that's correct. Okay, yeah, my bad, my bad, yeah. So binary search tree, which you guys will only be working with binary search trees, I believe, can't have duplicate values, but binary trees, which are just uh, binary search trees with duplicate values. Um, so let's draw out this insertion really quick. So we have, I have two sets of data right here. So we'll start off with data two just because it's a lot, we get to see the insert algorithm actually work better because if you guys know how uh, binary search trees work, you'll know that this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 is just going to be the parent is one, and then you're just going to be adding to the right child every single time, just because it just keeps getting bigger and bigger. But the 6, 9, 3, 8, 10 data set is going to be a balanced tree. So it's just going to be a lot better in explaining how the insertion works. So um, we know that we know that this first thing is satisfied because the node that we're working with is obviously none. There's nothing on the board. The, um, the, the search tree is, has no values and we just insert six into that first value. So let's just keep track of the count. So before count was zero, but now it's one because we, uh, we inserted. And so now let's insert nine. So if we scroll up to the insert, we can see that the value that we want to insert is greater than the node value that we passed into the insert function. So the, the node value is this, and we're trying to insert nine. So we go to the right, and we do the same thing. And the node that we're currently on, since we're going to node dot underscore right, there's no right child right here. So we can just insert it the same way as before how we inserted the six. So now this tree is going to be six, nine. Oh. Six, nine. All right. So next value that we want to insert is three. It's going to be the same exact thing as the nine, except we're going to the left because obviously it's smaller. And once we get here, nothing here. So we can just insert nine right there. And I guys, I think you guys can see where this is going. So the eight, it's going to go right, then it's smaller than the nine, so it's gonna go left and we can just insert it right here. So eight goes there and then we have 10, I think. And so 10 goes right because it's bigger than six, goes right again because it's bigger than nine and we have 10 here. So that's pretty much how you insert into a binary tree, binary search tree. So let's look at the remove function. So the remove function uh, searches the binary search tree for a value, takes it out if it's there, and returns that value. So 
we see here that, um, actually, hold on. The remove func uh, no, no, no. The remove function itself just calls this, and then, okay. So the remove is just going to be a little bit more complicated because we want to rebalance the tree when we remove it. So if we were to remove this, we can't just leave it here with no right child, no right child here, and these two values still here. We're going to have to find a replacement for this 9. So that's why removing in a binary search tree is just a little bit more complicated, but we'll look at that right now. So these two things are the exact same. Uh, if the key that we want is less than node value, we go to the left. If it's greater than, we go to the right. And now this else means that we have found the value in the binary search tree, which is good. So the value, this is the value that we're returning, equals node value. So obviously, let me just put the 9 back there. The 9. So this is our value now. And uh, we can decrease the count. Well, I wasn't really updating it, but it's fine. So if node left is none, so let's actually, let's have the example that we're removing three right now. So let's say we're removing three. This is our value. So this first case is now satisfied. If it has no children, which is good for us, we can just remove it and nothing is going to happen to the tree because six can just have no left child and it won't really... There's no data here to really um, interfere with that. But, um, so now we can go to the next case where if node left is none, so let's say we have, I don't know, value 5 right here. So the left node is none. So we can remove 3 and insert 5 in its place right there. So again, now we have no data that's interfering. So we can see that right here. If node left is none, node equals node right. And if node right is none, which is just the opposite, it equals node left. So now this means that we have two children, which is here because we've already passed the node left and node right is none. So if node left right is none, so if the left, if this node is none, then we can just say that the replacement node, which is going to go here, can just equal this. Pretty simple. That's just how binary search trees work. But if it's not none, so let's say it has a value, we can't move this up here anymore because then this, this value is going to be stuck here with no parent. So we're going to have to say that the replacement node equals... We have another helper function. Sorry, I didn't really go through this. But this is just deleting left node. So the child equals parent.write. If child.write is none, so let's, let's just draw this out so it's easy to visualize. So child, let's say we have, let me just create the same tree as before. And five. So let's say we pass it the six value. Um, child equals parent right, so this is the child variable. If child right is none, which it isn't in this case, so we can skip over that, um, else the replacement node equals self.delete node left, so we just go to this one. And now we're passing the recursive function on this. So now we say the same thing, so the child is now this 10, and if, sorry, I'm losing my train of thought, but it's in essence what this delete node left is doing is just finding the biggest, um, the smallest node in the right subtree is what it's doing. So we're just going to keep going left um, until we find the node that we're looking for there. And this is just useful because when we have this, we can't like, we can't just replace this with anything we want. We have to find like a value that fits into this role because we want it to be um, larger than six, but um, smaller than whatever this is, right? Uh, this also can't be here. Or, or larger than whatever this is as well. So we have to look for something that's on the left, um, the left of whatever we're deleting, uh, but also on its right so that it can be bigger than the left. 
so that it's still a binary search tree. So that's pretty much what this, um, this is doing right here. So that's pretty much just insertion and deletion in binary search trees. I'm sorry I made the, the removing a bit more difficult than it is, but like all you're really doing is just finding a proper value to fit in here. And if this were the case, you could just move, move the eight up and delete it right here. So that's all it is. All right, so it's a bit past eight o'clock. I know I promised you guys a break at eight, but if you guys want, can grab some snacks. We'll just take a quick intermission for five, 10 minutes. And we'll get back into it. We're kind of like done the slides. I'll look at some study tips when we get back and then you guys can ask any questions that you have. All right, welcome back, viewers on Twitch. Just took a bit of a break to get some snacks. You guys wish you were here. Um, okay, so we're just going to go over a few study tips about, like, just what to study, I feel like. And, yeah. Okay, so my main study tip, obviously, is to just practice with the linked data structures. This is going to be a huge, huge part of your exam. Um more than likely you're going to have to code a data structure that you haven't seen before. It's all good. Uh, you're going to have to code a data structure that you haven't really seen before, a linked data structure. Um, it's not going to be extremely complicated for me. I think I had a set, so it was just a list, a linked list that, um, that didn't have any duplicates, for instance. So it's going to be something very similar to that or around the same level as that. And you guys should also get pretty familiar with the code of the sorting algorithms. I know I didn't go over it because you're given it all in your, um, in your lab notes, but I think you guys should go over it and maybe look at some visualizations of the, of the sorting algorithms to really understand how they work because you might be asked to implement a very simple sorting algorithm on your exam and just like test it like how you were doing in your last lab. Um, Another thing that was on it, uh, we'll go over big O now just because I know I was asked questions about that and there's like a lot of confusion around that. Um, there's one more thing, definitely binary search trees as well. They're gonna be pretty important. Um, you guys are probably gonna have to implement functions that you haven't really seen before. Yep, is there a question? What was the instructor? Uh, what was the data structure? Oh, the data structure, sorry. Oh, we, we implemented a set. I, I think I said that before, but we implemented a set. So pretty much just a linked list, or we implemented a linked set. So just um, a linked list with no duplicates. So we just had to, you know, just uh, switch around the insertion and, and, and deletion. Well, not really the deletion, but like just the insertion to make sure that when we inserted, there would be no more of the, um, like the value we were inserting wasn't already in the list. And that's pretty much like the, the level of what the data structure that you're implementing should be. So, um, yeah, I think we can go over big O now and I can take questions after that. Yeah, we can wrap it up after that. So, um, uh, really quickly, let me just go back to our previous review session because I had a big O example that I like looking at. And I think that's very easily understandable. One sec, sorry. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Uh, okay, so Okay, so let's just look at a few big O time complexities and just their graphs so we understand why different big O time complexities function in the way that they do with certain data types. 
So big O analysis is just used to analyze the efficiency of any given algorithm. The lower the big O, the more efficient the algorithm is. So O log of N, as the input size increases, it's already, so running time is on the, uh, the Y axis and input size or N is on the X axis. So O of log N stays pretty constant and it stays very close to the X axis. So that means it's very efficient with both large sized inputs and small size inputs. Y you can see here that uh, obviously O of one, which is constant time, is gonna be the best efficiency just because we know it's constant and we know it's just about instant with anything. So O of N is a linear. So um, the, the larger the input size gets, it's gonna be proportional to uh, how long it takes. And O N log of N, which we had one sorting algorithm or two sorting algorithms for is, um, it's just pretty much you're multiplying these two. So it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna get a lot slower as uh, the input size increases. And O of N to the power of C, which is like N squared, N cubed, whatever. These ones like, are pretty efficient for the uh, the small sets, but they shoot up in running time complexity very fast because obviously you're squaring or you're cubing um, like the input size whenever you're doing a function. So these are like nested for loops, nested while loops if you're not really cutting the, um, the input. And uh, the factorial and uh, the, uh, the other exponential we don't really look at, but they're obviously extremely inefficient, as you guys can see, and that's most likely why we don't really look at them when we're, we're trying to be good programmers. So, we looked at this. Okay, so this is just an example of a constant time complexity. So, C equals A plus B. Any arithmetic is going to be executed instantaneously and it's always going to be O of one time complexity. So whenever you see arithmetic, you can literally just disregard it because when we do big O time um, analysis, we're always looking for the worst case. So let's say um, for the Twitch viewers, I'm just going to be drawing a nested for loop and then actually I'll just go, I'll say it as we go along. So let's say I have for I in list. Let's say this is a 2D list. So for I in list, this is um, the amount of rows. And for J in list I. What not? So this is a nested for loop. And we know that this is going to give us a time complexity of O N squared. Because this is O of N. And this is O of N, so we can just multiply them to get O of N squared. But let's say later on in our function, we have another for loop. Let's say just another for I in list. It doesn't really matter what it is. So this is also going to have an O of N, right? So we're, when we're like analyzing big O, we're supposed to do O of N squared plus N. So this is the, like the time complexity, but we can just cross out this N because we're really just looking for the worst case. And it doesn't really matter that this is here because our worst case is already O of N squared. So it's the same thing with this C equals A plus B. Let's say later on, we ha or actually let's say right here, we have C equals A plus B. It's whatever, it, like the C doesn't really matter, the A doesn't matter, and the B doesn't matter. But this is always gonna be O of one. So that means we're gonna have O of N squared plus n plus one. And we can just cancel out these because we're, again, we're just looking at our worst case. So that's a constant function. Like we were talking about before, a linear function is a for loop. It's linear because as the list increases in size, the time complexity is also gonna increase because we're looking at every single piece of data in the list regardless. We're not cutting the list down by, um, by any size, it's always gonna be incremented by one, unless you have like the range or whatever, but like when you're doing for I in list, it's always gonna be the I's getting incremented by one. So we're always looking at every single item in the list and that makes the time complexity O of N because N being the size of the list in this case. So 
Now, logarithmic. So as we were talking about before, a while loop can have both a linear and logarithmic time complexity because of how I was explaining before why, where a while loop can just go through a list the same way that a for loop does where it just touches every single point. But let's say this here, when you're cutting the, um, the i value by two, for instance, you're cutting it down so that you don't have to go through every single i value um, until you reach zero. And this should, this is incorrect because there should be, actually no, that's correct, never mind. But yeah, so you're cutting the, the value of i by two every single time and that like makes it logarithmic time complexity. Whenever you cut down um, a set of data, either by two or more, obviously, it's gonna be logarithmic time, yeah. So it doesn't have to be two. It doesn't have to be two, no, but. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we have exponential time complexity like we were talking about before. This is just an example. Obviously, if you have three nested for loops, it's going to be O of n times O of n times O of n. So it'll be O n cubed. And we have... Let's just go through an example really quickly of analyzing this function. So this is just... Um, uh, an insertion, I intersection function of two sets. So I think, I don't remember exactly what it does, but I think it just finds value in both. Um, if they appear in both uh, self and source, you add them to a new list or something. But regardless, so any variable definition is always gonna be uh, o of a one. So it's always gonna be constant just because it happens inst instantaneously. We don't really have to worry about it. It's, it's not really a computer like processing heavy um, function. So for loops are O of N of course, but here's the thing that we have not discussed yet. When you do if value in source, this is also gonna be an O of N operator just because the in function looks through every single value in source in search of value. So if source were to have N characters, it would have to look through every single one of those N values to find value it's looking for. So even though we don't have a nested for loop or a nested loop in any sense, it's still gonna be O of N, actually let's like, let get to the end before I spoil it. Nested linear statements means this function is gonna have a time complexity of O of N squared. So we can just ignore the two constants like I was demonstrating before on the whiteboard. And our big O time complexity, our worst case is gonna be O of N squared because of the two nested linear statements. So I know we were trying to go a bit in depth into this, but I, I don't have any more functions prepared for big O. So I don't wanna leave the Twitch viewers out by just drawing a function, but I think that's what we're gonna to have to do just to like analyze just a bit more. So let's say we have a while loop here. While i uh, is less than length of list, um, i plus equals one, uh, if i, is um, divisible by two, then uh, print i. So, pretty simple function, but through this we can see that um, we're just going through the entire list with the while loop, incrementing i by one every time. This if statement not all if statements are gonna be linear. Only the ones, oh, let's make this full screen again, just so it's, only the ones that I explained where it has the in, um, the in operator are gonna have linear time complexity. So even though this is nested in the same way that this is nested, this is still only gonna be, this if statement is only gonna be an O of one. This is gonna be O of N and the print is obviously gonna be O of one, and the arithmetic here is gonna be O of one. So if we have all of this combined, it's gonna be O of N plus one, plus one, plus one, and we can just cross all of these out because we want worst case, so it's gonna be O of N in the end. So 
I hope that helped you guys a little bit more in understanding Big O. I'm not really, do you guys, sorry for me asking this, but do you guys have a Big O quiz in your final exam? Um, we already had it. You already had it? Oh, okay. Because, like, no, when I took CP164, it was just, like, of the, of the final, right? Yeah, okay. Because, like, we had it for the midterm and the final for mine, but I guess. Okay, okay. Yeah, so it's going to be very similar to, like, these kinds of questions. I took intersection because I remember it was on mine from CP164. So it's going to be very similar to these kinds of questions where they try to trick you with the if value in source or whatever and stuff like that, but. Yeah. So I think that takes us pretty much to the end of the material. Oh. Takes us pretty much to the end of the material. So if you guys have any questions, whether that be about the midterm itself or content on the midterm, I'm glad to answer any questions. If you guys want Twitch chat viewers, uh, we can answer those as well. Yep. Yeah, so the BST, we were given a BST already completed, and we had to do like two functions. I think it was like a rotate function or something, and it would, I don't wanna, I think it was like a rotate function, and then another one where it was like intersection or something like that, but it's just like working with BSTs. You're cr it was like two functions. It wasn't too much, but it was just working with BSTs, and if you really understand them, they aren't, they aren't comp like very difficult. Um, what did you have to do for the uh, I think you just had a node and, uh, sorry. Uh, I think you like, if this was the tree, let me switch hands, I don't know why I'm doing that. So if this was a tree or something, I don't remember completely, it was a couple semesters ago, but that's not right. Seven, 10, let's say, um, I think you like, had to take this and like like rotate this somehow, but like I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was just a function where you had to mess with like how they were inserted. You were like inserting something and it was rotating, but I don't know, it wasn't, it wasn't too, like trust me, I'm, I'm making it out way more uh, complicated than it seems just because I don't really remember the question that, that much, but like it's not, it's not something to s like stress over too much. Anybody else have any questions? Is anybody in the Twitch that's saying anything? Yeah. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, who wants to play Fortnite? I do not. Um, guys, in the Twitch chat, drop any questions. I'll answer them right now. Yep. Uh, what about sorting, questions? sorting questions. Yeah. So uh, we had to implement uh, a sorting function called gnome sort. Uh, it's v like, it's probably the most simple sorting function there is, but that's like, that's the extent of the question. It was just like, um, implement the sorting function and just test it how you did on the last lab, I think, something like that. Yep. It was, it'll probably be something other than that. I was just saying for mine personally. I honestly, I have no clue. I'm not, I don't know. Yeah, no, I, I honestly have no clue. I'm sorry. But yeah, it's just like, it's something like around the same difficulty as gnome sort. If, but it's, it, there's definitely going to be a sorting question on your exam just because you guys learned it so recently that it's like going to have to be tested. Anything else, guys? I thought it was a little bit easier than the midterm, but that was me personally because, I don't know, I, I found linked data structures were easier to work with, but that's just me personally. But I think it's, all, it's around the same level, yeah, yeah. I think the class average was the same between the two. Um, yeah, I think, like, 
the sorting stuff was kind of difficult just because it was so recent when we learned it. So I'd honestly say just practice your sorting algorithms. But other than that, no, it's like, it's very straightforward. The questions that they ask you, like, they're like not extremely similar to what you've seen. They're similar to what you've seen, but it's not like any of the questions you've answered from the assignments. Like there's no given marks is, is all I'm saying. It's like everything that you should know has been given to you, but like you're not gonna be implementing like an insert, let's say, from for a binary search tree. You're gonna be implementing an insert for something that you haven't seen before, or you're gonna be implementing a similar like level of function for a binary search tree, for instance. But no, it's not harder than the midterm. Um, I don't think they force you to, to do anything recursive, but I think obviously when you're working with binary search trees, you should be using recursion. And I'm pretty sure the functions that we did do for the binary search trees, you had to like, not had to, but like it was much, much easier if you use recursion with them. Yep. Um, you about the no, 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 no. It's just if it works, if it runs, if it compiles, that's it. Yeah, the one that I showed, the intersection, I'm pretty sure was an example. But they're going to be, like, I, one sec, one sec, one sec. I, just because I am in your, uh, I can s pull up some of the questions. Just because I'm still in, sorry, this is just going to take me two seconds. I'm looking for big O questions for those streaming on Twitch that are likely to be on your exam. Yeah, so they're gonna be like, um, I think you're gonna have a section where you're given a table of like times and you're gonna convert that to big O, which is pretty simple. It's just like the math part of it. You're gonna be given like actual code questions, like for instance, like what I was given here, like nothing uh, more difficult than like these questions, like the fur, the nested for loops, the if in and list or something like that, like pretty similar to that. And then uh, I'll give you guys a question because I think this is your um, your exam. The one that I'm looking at right now is like, what's the big O for the linked stack pop method? Something like that. Yeah, that's right. So that's like, that's pretty much the questions similar to that. Like those are gonna be the three sections of it. Any more questions, guys? Yep. Um, that was, you just said it, I just practiced. Like you just have to do a bunch of these linked structures. Like you, like go online and find other implementations of structures that you really haven't seen before. Like maybe look up the linked set structure that I told you guys about. Um, honestly, like I was just, I just looked through my quizzes and stuff like that. Not quizzes, sorry. Uh, my labs, my assignments, like just saw how I did it, what mistakes I made as well, and seeing how uh, the answers differed from my own like code, stuff like that. That's really how I practiced. It was just like any other exam. I didn't really do much different. Yeah, I think So if those on the Twitch chat didn't hear that, there is on the bore, um, if it's not already posted, it will be posted, I'm pretty sure, because it's released every year. But um, there's going to be a priority, like pr linked priority queue uh, linked list with some like functions tweaked a little bit. And so that's pretty much the main type of question that like 
would appear on the final exam. It's just like very similar to what you've done in class, but like not similar enough to a point where you can memorize it and just like spit out the code again. They want you to understand it and apply it with other functions that are very similar. So that's like, that's what's gonna be on the final pretty much. Yeah, so if you guys on the Twitch chat didn't hear that, um, uh, a couple of us were just saying that uh, even if you don't know exactly what the body of the code is going to be, just write down something like a return statement with the proper returns definition of the function, and um, you'll get part marks at least. And somebody said, I saw something on priority and popularity BST. That's right. So it's not going to be, it's going to be a binary tree, but like, uh, popularity, I think you guys had that, like a, what's it called? It's called something else, it's not a popularity one, but regardless. Um, actually, wait, priority and popularity, no, that's just, I don't think those are different data types. Those are just, uh, or data structures, sorry, those are just, um, just uh, the way that the data was inserted into the BST. Like I know the popularity one was just um, sorted so that it was more efficient with like comparisons and whatnot. I'm not sure if those are actually gonna be data types that you'll come across or data structures. Anyone else? Any questions? I'll leave questions open for the Twitch chat for just a bit longer. And if there's nothing, we can wrap it up in a couple minutes. So. Thank you guys so much for coming out. It was a, it was a pleasure talking to you all. Thank you guys all for listening on Twitch too.